did you murder him? With a gun. I shot him in the head twice. I got the brain, and she got up, grabbed him, and then I put on my knife and I killed her. The shooting was going on the ground, and that was that. What had happened to her? That's when she got shot. She had to go down the stairs, and I dropped the gun. A gruesome murder is committed and the investigators have to solve the riddle of the identity of the murderer. They make some discoveries at the scene, which would come in handy in solving the mystery. At the bottom of the ditch, very hastily covered with some leaves and a stick, there was a body of a young male. There were multiple gunshot wounds. Under Sheriff J.T. Palmer receives a call alerting him to a possible suspect, Jared Murray lurking around the vicinity of the crime. The undersheriff is suspicious of Jared, and he arrests him. I said, I'm going to ask you one time, do you have a weapon on you? And he said, no, but I am the guy you're trying to find. I'm the guy that killed the guy on Substation Road. Jared is taken in for questioning, but this questioning is a shocking one, as it doesn't go in the way you would expect a conventional confession should. At about 3.12 this morning, didn't we? Yes, sir. Okay, and what do you remember telling me? Uh, in summation that I'm guilty, yes. Of what? Of murder. Okay, and who did you murder? Uh, Gennaro. I do not know how to spell that, but it is with a G. Okay, and then how did you murder him? With a... Uh, Gun. I shot him in the head twice. You would expect a murderer to be remorseful and repentant, but it is different with Jared, as he narrates in detail his intent and how he commits the crime. Talk about a cold-hearted murderer. How did you guys hook up? I went down to his dorm room and asked if I could be given a ride to Walmart in exchange for $20 gas money. We pulled into the parking lot, then I pulled the uh, weapon on him and demanded that he take me to Asher, Oklahoma, sir. And yeah, why did all of a sudden did you decide that you need to go to Asher? Because I was planning to take him out into the country and kill him. And so I guess at some point, did you decide it was, now was the time? Yes, sir. His intent for the crime is more shocking than his initial confession. Admitting to a crime without pressure is one thing, but giving details and stating your intent is another. You killed a young man? Yes, sir. Why did you do it? If I'm pressed to answer, I'll say it's to prove the strength of my resolve, but that's only if I'm pressed to answer. I'm not pressing you, I'm just trying to understand. Then I don't know why. Okay. So it just popped in my head. And why him? Uh, are all the kids in college or why? I believed that he would have had the least impact, sir. Impact of what? Uh, I believed he didn't have many friends, or many close friends, I should rephrase. His absence would be less notable. The undersheriff indeed has a lot running through his mind, not just with the suspect's confession and his intent, but also with his stance on the punishment. Do you feel any remorse? No. A while after his arrest, Jared goes on trial for his crime. His sentence leaves everyone in shock. Jared Murray's defense counsel had him evaluated. They very quickly found him to meet the clinical, the legal findings of not guilty by reason of insanity. Antisocial personality disorder. The characteristics are a flat effect, a lack of empathy, a lack of impulse control, and a bunch of other things that fit Gerard Murray to a T. With the court of public opinion, things can change. And Jared's case is no exception.
An unusual trait of Flora Rundle leaves her sister suspicious when all efforts to reach her prove abortive. Sisters tried to contact her, but were unable to reach her. So the two of them actually drove over to her place. As they approached the front door, they happened to notice that the front door was ajar about three inches uh, wide. They knew that was very unusual for Flora because she always would keep her door closed and locked. When they finally get a hold of her in her house, they're shocked by her state and try to get help. As they entered into the residence, one of the sisters went into the bathroom. Flora was lying on the bathroom floor, unclothed, with a pool of blood around her. One of her sisters actually picked up the telephone to try to contact 911, but the line was dead. The deputy sheriff makes some baffling discoveries, makes a pronouncement, and verifies her death. A deputy sheriff verified that she was deceased. He also noticed the residence had been ransacked. Some type of a struggle had occurred. There was damage to the door, indicating that there was some type of forced entry. Our telephone line, which was connected into her residence, was cut just above the eave of her home. With his discoveries, the deputy sheriff contacts the homicide unit. The homicide unit makes a shocking revelation. The deputy believed that this was some type of a suspicious death and contacted the homicide unit. Later on in the investigation, the autopsy revealed that Flora had been stabbed 11 times. Flora's case goes cold, as there are little or no leads to helping cracking the case. Probably with a knife six to seven inches in length. We're back in the late 80s. Back then, there wasn't DNA. So as far as fingernails and swabs being collected, they really couldn't determine much. Not just a couple of years, but a long time after the case was opened, there was a breakthrough in the form of special funding for DNA tests on unsolved cases. Deputy Sheriff makes discoveries and follows these newly discovered leads which will give us headway in solving this mystery. After reviewing the case, I realized there were fingernail clippings and there was a pair of slacks found on Flora's bed at the time of the crime that potentially could yield DNA. I submitted those two items to a private lab for testing. They were able to determine that there was DNA from an unknown male. Finally, we have a possible lead and suspect. There was a match on the DNA, and the match came back to an individual by the name of Gary Dean Hilficker. So I started doing research on Gary and realized that he was already in the Utah State Prison for another murder that actually occurred in 1992, so it would have occurred after Flora Rundle's murder. We have our suspect, and from the questioning, as with every suspect in a murder case, he does not appear very forthcoming with the answers we need. I know I've done some, some stuff out there, but I don't know if I did this, I can't say I did or didn't. He was so stoic and not really volunteering any information, which made it an extreme challenge. We were concerned that he might not give us answers. As a professional, the deputy sheriff prevails in getting Gary Hilfiker to talk and ascertain his role in Flora's death. Leaning into the aspect of Gary's faith, the deputy sheriff gets him to talk instead sing. In the city of Wanseca, Minnesota, Alec Kruger places an emergency call. Within seconds of calling 911 to report two murders, another gunshot rings out. Alec Kruger had called 911 and reported that there had been an intruder at his residence and that his parents had been shot. You hear what sounds like a possible gunshot and then the call goes dead. Deputy Sheriff Trevor Kanewisher drives out that night to the Kruger residence. At the scene of the incident, Trevor finds the Kruger family dead. Alec was found lying on the bed. 
and Tracy was on the floor on the opposite side of the bed in that main bedroom. Tracy Kruger and Alec Kruger were both deceased and appeared to have multiple gunshot wounds. Hillary Kruger had suffered a gunshot wound and she was in very critical condition. Further investigations revealed the identity of a possible suspect. One vehicle registered to the Kruger family and another registered to our suspect are found at the end of the driveway. There are also footprints leading out of the vehicle. There was a single set of footprints leaving the vehicles. The license plates were run on the vehicles and that's what told us that one was registered to Michael Zabawa and the other one was registered to the Kruger family. At that point, we are gonna wanna talk to Michael Zabawa we had not processed the crime scene to any degree at that point. Michael Zabawa is called in for questioning, and like a deer caught in between the headlights, when presented an undeniable fact by the investigators, he gives a narration as to his whereabouts the night of the incident. Initially, you said you were home from 5 o'clock on. Well, that's not true. Then you said you were home at 11. Well, that's not true. You see what I mean? And your mom says she heard you come in around 3.30 in the morning. Tell us the real story. We left the bar and it was probably... It was cold and it was about 1.30, about 1.30, somewhere in there. Went to the house, sat there. That was probably... They had a few more beers at his place. Um, I left there, it was about 3 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning. The tide of the interrogation takes a turn when Agent Leatherman joins the team. Leatherman points out to Michael in a confrontational manner his motive, a medium of committing the crime. Michael's back is up against the wall at this point, and he is grasping at straws. You did this and a child was killed. You're in somebody else's house when you're not supposed to be in their house. And they are gonna either assault you to stop you from doing that, but they're gonna call the cops. <clears throat> now that's why I think, personally, that's why I think you shot them. It's because you were trying to protect yourself. That's the only reason that I can see. Am I right? Seeing that he has nowhere to go, Michael tells the story of how he got into Kruger's residence. He paints a picture of acting in self-defense. He gives the investigators an account of the previous night. Well, uh, I was going to turn it on, and then all of a sudden he pumped the gun. He pumped the round into the gun? And jacked the pumper. Yeah. Okay, and then what? That's why, that's why I turned it on, and he grabbed it, grabbed it so that he wouldn't do anything. Okay. Then what happened? And then I got it away from the it went off. I went off like three times and I got it. Okay. So then it goes off and then how did it hit the wife? When we were struggling. When you're struggling? Yeah. Are they saying anything to you? The shit is just going, oh my God, and then that was it. What happened there? That's when she got shot. She had to go down the stairs and I dropped the gun. Right. And the kid was standing there too. Talking on the phone? Yep. Okay, so you dropped the gun and then it went off? Okay. Did you see it hit the kid? Huh? No. 